Hola. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Jordan Rutter, Director of Communications at American Bird Conservancy. Before we begin, I want to share some background about American Bird Conservancy, shortened to ABC, which was founded in 1994 with the mission of protecting wild birds and their habitats across the Americas. We continue that work today following a conservation strategy outlined by the pyramid featured on the current slide. Our work strives to keep common birds common and prevent the rarest species from going extinct. At ABC, we often like to focus on the big picture of bird and habitat conservation, but sometimes that big picture is best explained through the incredible story of one very small, very round bird. Let's travel in time and place to 1989 in the misty highland cloud forest habitat of Columbia. That's when Peter Kaesner, more on him in a second, had his first encounter with a bird he had never observed before, and a bird that had never been officially documented before the Cundinamarca amphitheta. The fact it was just one bird and one bird previously unknown to science made one thing quite clear. This species had a small population and was in need of immediate conservation efforts to prevent any further decline in numbers or worse. Those conservation efforts take us all the way to today when a newly established reserve for this leggy charismatic species also provides habitat for birds like the resident grass green tanager and the migratory Blackburnian warbler and opportunities for science and ecotourism. The Cundinamarca Ampitta is a symbol of hope and success in bird conservation. Its story is a testament to how birds bring us together and what's possible when we come together for birds. I'm so excited for you to learn the rest of this story, so to do that, let's meet our guests. First up, we have Peter Kaesner, who is a retired U.S. diplomat and a world-renowned birder who has spent a lifetime sharing his passion for birds. This year, Peter became the first birder ever to observe 10,000 species. He graduated from Friends School in Baltimore and studied biology at Cornell University. He has lived in 12 different countries and the highlight of his birding career came in 1989 when he discovered the Cundinamarca ant pitta in Colombia, which was named in his honor. Born and raised in Colombia, Eliana Ferreira Calderon received a bachelor's of science in biology from Universidad del Valle in Cali and a master's in GIS from Universidad San Francisco de Quito in Ecuador. For over a decade, she has been working for the conservation of threatened and endemic bird species and their habitats in the Andes and the Pacific coast of Colombia. Eliana is the author of the conservation plans of four endangered bird species, as well as many books and other outreach materials. She also participated in several field research projects in Borneo, Ecuador, and the U.S. Last but not least, Natalia Otero is a representative of Fundacion Camana, which was founded in 2017 as an extension of the process of creating the Rancho Camana Nature Reserve in Restrepo Meta, Colombia. Among its activities, the foundation studies and provides education about birds and is working to strengthen bird tourism in the Orneokia natural region. Currently, another flagship program is the Harpy Magic Alliance, which aims to promote conservation of the harpy eagle through community tourism. And with that, I'll turn it over to Peter. Peter will be speaking in English, so only click on the interpretation button if you want the presentation translated to Spanish. Welcome, Peter. Welcome, it's so nice to be here. I hope everybody can hear me and see me. Yep, you're good to go. Very good. Um, I have a great story. I've been bird watching all my life. And for most of my adult life, I was a US diplomat. In 1988, I went to Bogota, Colombia for a two year assignment at the US Embassy there, accompanied by my wife, Kimberly. Uh, I was a consular officer. So I had two jobs. One year I worked taking care of American citizens. And the second year I worked on trying to stop visa fraud, which was a real problem in that time. While I was working on American citizens, I went down for a weekend to Via Vicencio to visit some Americans that had been having trouble with, uh, let's say, violence, uh, insecurity. Uh, one of their uh, missionaries had been captured, and I think one of them had been killed. And uh, I wanted to show the flag. I wanted to go down and, and show them that the U.S. government cared about them. So I went and spent the weekend. On the way back, I took a little road from Monte Redondo 
to just do a little birding in the in the cloud forest on my way home. As I was birding in this beautiful, beautiful, lush, very, very wet forest, I heard a bird off in the distance that was unusual. I didn't didn't recognize it. And uh, I made a tape recording of it. At the time, there was a compra pond, the chestnut crown ant pit, it was calling just about the same time. So it was a pretty crummy recording. But I played it back and the bird came a little bit closer. And eventually the chestnut capped ant or chestnut crowned ant pitta stopped calling. And I got some really good, clear recordings of the mystery bird. It took 45 minutes. And after about 40 minutes, the bird started calling from behind me on the other side of the road. And somehow the crazy bird had flown across the road without me seeing it. So I crawled up into the forest on my hands and knees and found a small clearing up above the road, played the tape again a couple more times, and boop, it popped up on a log 45 minutes after I first heard it. And as soon as I saw it, I knew that it was a new bird for Columbia because I knew the birds of Columbia really, really well. But I didn't know if it was possibly a Peruvian or even Bolivian species from the Eastern Andes that had never been recorded in Colombia. So as soon as I got home, I checked a book of the birds of, of South America and it was very clear that I had found a bird that was new to science. And the excitement of that is, is something that's it's hard to imagine. It was really, I mean, it's something that, that bird watchers can't even dream of because it's such a rare event. So I sent a recording, uh, copies of the recordings. This is before the internet, of course. Um, this is the, the 16th of October, 1989, when this happened. But I sent copies, uh, little cassette tapes of the uh, calls to a couple of people, including, um, I think, uh, Ted Parker and uh, Bob Ridgely. And they both came back and said, no, it's, it's, it's a new species that uh, is, is unknown to science. So that was in October, and I went back several times to see it. I was very careful. I didn't want anybody to know about it because I was afraid somebody might steal the bird, which is something that actually happens. So finally in May, I went with Dr. Gary Graves, who is a, uh, a Gary Stiles, who's a American ornithologist living in Bogota, and we managed to capture one of the birds in a mist net. And about three years later, he published an article uh, in Wilson Bolton describing the species, and he was very generously named after me, Grelaria Kaysneri. So let's fast forward, uh, boy, 2018. I had been contacted um, by the U.S. Embassy to help the Colombian government um, increase bird tourism in remote areas as in the aftermath of a peace treaty that was signed with the FARC, the main guerrilla group in Colombia. And I worked with uh, the Colombian government and the Audubon Society. And there's a guy named John Myers, who was a instrumental person in that process. We ended up having a Paradiala Diplomatica or a diplomatic bird watching trip to Northern uh, Colombia. And we did that with several um, media outlets and newspapers and television and raised a lot of interest in that part bird watching in that part of uh, of Colombia. It was a, a great experience. A couple of years later John sent me an email and he asked me what was I doing to help protect my bird and I said well fortunately I'm not really doing anything but I guess I should be doing something. So he helped organize a trip down to uh, the Eastern Andes of Colombia. And in uh, 2000, early 2002 or 2022, I went down to the very spot where I heard and seen that bird in 1989. And I was devastated. I was devastated to see that the beautiful forest where I found this new species was a cattle pasture. And it was it was just awful. This is a, a picture that I took at that point. And you can hardly imagine what I felt to go to such a, a beautiful place that it meant so much to me. 
um, and find that it was just plain gone. All these beautiful trees. And there, there's so many millions of cattle in the world. Why in the world do you cut down a valuable forest just for more cattle? It just, it was terrible. So anyway, um, John had some friends. He knew the the uh, Natalia and the others in Fundacion Kamana. So we went down and met them and had a wonderful time. I was just so impressed with their, their energy and their competence. They, they were just, they were the kind of people that you wanted to do business with. They were just they, the kind of people that get things done. And it's so rare in this world to find people who have their hearts in the right place and also are very, very good at getting things done. So, they asked me if I had money to buy land to to help save my my uh, my aunt Pitta. and unfortunately, I'm not a rich person. I I have a lot of of riches in my life, but uh, a lot of money is not one of them. But I was able to come back and use some of my contacts, and I put together a little proposal and sent it around to a couple of organizations that I thought might be interested in ABC was immediately interested. They put together a serious proposal. They did some work, did some groundwork, some, uh, some checking of, of, of various legal matters. And voila, within about a year and a half or so, they have created this wonderful reserve for, for the Kundinamarca and Pitta. And it is all based around a family, the Herrera family, that during the COVID lockdown started feeding the bird. So I was able to go back to this area where the reserve is now and actually see my bird after so many, many decades. And it was as emotional seeing it the second time as it was seeing it back in 1989 and 1990. Um, it just, there is a, a, an almost spiritual connection that I have with that bird. It is just, it, it, it just, it brought tears to my eyes to see it. It was so wonderful. And now to know, that with the help of the ABC and the Fundacion Kamana, that we have a wonderful reserve that, that protects a really core area of this, this bird's habitat. It, uh, it's just wonderful. And I'm just so excited. What an incredible story, Peter. Thank you so much for sharing that. We'll have you come back on at the end during the Q&A portion. Um, but next up, we're going to have Eliana speak, and she will be speaking in English. So again, only click on the interpretation button if you want to have the presentation translated to Spanish. Eliana, I can see you, and your screen is all set up if you just want to unmute. Sorry. <laughs> can you hear me? Can you see my screen? You're good. Take it away. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jordan. And thank you, Peter. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little more about what we know of the species, um, um, how ABC ended up working with Fundacion Camana to protect habitat for the Cundinamarca and PETA. So Peter already described how he met the species. This is a medium-sized ampita, approximately six inches tall. It has a whitish throat, a streaked breast, and it's mostly like olive brown. Um, the species is, his range is very restricted, as you can see in the map in the upper corner is just a tiny point in the eastern Andes, the eastern slope of the eastern Andes in Colombia, between the capital Bogota and the city of Villavicencio. And it has been recorded in mainly in two places, the Farallones de Medina, like in the north, very close, like in the outskirts of the Chingaza National Park, and in the municipality of Guayabetal. The red point that you see right there is Monte Redondo, a place where Peter initially like found the species, and the blue point er, is where we are working right now with Fundacion Camana. Um, here 
You can see um, the records of these species in Eva right now. It's like a very restricted range between these two localities. And most of these records are previous to 2015, 2018. The current records are more mostly uh, focused in the um, in the, around the current, like the new reserve. And because of this um, range that is so restricted and the few individuals that are not of the species is uh, currently categorized as endangered by the IUCN. So, um, as Peter was saying, like the Ampita loves the very wet primary and secondary cloud forest, very close canopy, a lot of um, epiphytes, um, mainly between the 1200 and 2700 meters altitude. Um, in the right, you can see a photo from Guayabetal. This is the habitat she loves, very thick, dense, under understory vegetation. Uh, it spends most of his life in the in the ground and it feeds um, from insects. But um, yeah, the threats are many and deforestation is the main one in uh, these areas of Guayabetal and Farajones de Medina is mainly because of the uh, cattle pastures and agriculture. And as Peter mentioned, as soon as the habitat is gone, the bird is gone too. Um, with all this information we have from the species, um, ABC, a few, well, since a couple of years ago, have been running a gap analysis, not only for the Candida marcampita, but many other endangered species to um, learn like or calculate the estimate area where the, um, sorry, estimate habit, area of habitat for the species. Um, right now, the estimation is around 85,000 acres, which is roughly the size of Guadalupe Mountain National Park in Texas, in case you, you want like a U.S. comparison. Um, in the map, you can see the um, red shade is the area of habitat estimated for the Cundinamarca and PETA, and the green polygons are the protected areas in this sector right now. So the one that is really big, kind of like a butterfly shape, shape is Shingasa National Park, and the, the smaller ones are regional protected areas. Um, as you can see, the overlap is really not that high, just in a couple of sections, and is approximately only 19% of these um, estimated habitats for the species. Um, while this was happening, while ABC was like running this analysis, was happening simultaneously, all the story that Peter already uh, told us, he went back to Colombia, he um, started talking with, with John and with um, Fundacion Camana. So in August, 2022, we had like we ABC had our first contact with Fundacion Camana. Um, thank you to all the support of the donors at ABC and like ABC members. We got to sign an agreement with them pretty fast in December, 2022. And by March, 2023, we had already purchased, like complete the purchase of two out of the four properties that we wanted to, to acquire. And of course, our goal since the beginning was to protect habitat for the Cundinamarca and PETA. But like in this new area, we have found a bunch of other species that are benefiting from these, these protection. Um, there are other endangered species, but I'm only going to show you the migratory bird species just because it's closer to us here in the US. But for example, yellow-billed cuckoo, canna warbler, and olive sites like catcher that um, their population have been declining like constantly since the 70s. <clears throat> um, and Dan Levin, Vice President of Threatened Species, and I had the opportunity to visit Kamana in January 2020, 
2023, yes. Uh, we met the Herrera family. We met all the staff of Fundación Comaná. It, it was like, it, it has been a great experience to meet them all and work with them. They are really committed. Of course, we also saw the Ampira. I think it was a lifer for the both of us. Um, and I just wanted to like give them a shout out here, put them here. Natalia is going to tell you more about um, what they are doing, what they, uh, they are doing in their reserve. Um, but yeah, I'm just sharing here a couple of uh, logos and um, highlighted. Um, Conservadores, who was a uh, main donor for this project. That's wonderful, Eliana. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to stop my screen. Again, we'll oh. have Eliana come back um, at the Q&A at the end. But next up is Natalia. Uh, so Natalia, if you want to come on screen. Okay. Hello. Thank you so much. I am Natalia Otero. I am part of Fundación Camana, Camana Foundation, and somehow we are the ones taking care of this natural reserve. And so, so far it's 180 hectares of the reserve, but also when we acquired the reserve, we realized that we already had uh, areas that were destined for livestock and they were growing. So the agreement that made this agree this a real thing, we have been increasing the protection for the Kundiman, Kundinamarca and Pitta. We're talking about a very specific gradient uh, above sea level where we can find the Galaria. But like Eliana mentioned, we're not only protecting the necessary habitat for the Cundinamarca and Pita, but also like the brown bested parakeet or the chestnut crowd and Pita. And this is to be able to create benefits, but also we want to include benefits to the communities in the area. So we have a conservation agreement and this is the property of Don Daniel Herrera and his family. We have a conservation agreement with them and we are all working to achieve the same goal. So I'm not talking only of Fundación Camaná, but also Sendero La Herrería because they are the ones that provide the tourism services and they allow everyone to get to know the species better and i'm here thanks to all the donors to abc eliana and everyone that has made this reserve possible and also john myers because he was the one that dreamt about this and ha that eventually made it a reality natalia campo is our godmother in terms of analysis and research on galaria we don't know much about galaria but also she helped us analyze the information so we could decide what would be the economic benefits of conservation and peter as well because he represents all bird watchers and he also was observing the threats and the pressure that was threatening the species and he helped us knock on the right door and we arrived to guayabetal because we live in a natural reserve in restrepo and there we develop tourism, ecotourism activities. So the government of Guayabetal invited us to develop ecotourism projects in this place. And in 2019 was when we came across uh, the family of Don Ariel. And they knew that they lived near Galaria or the Cundinamarca and Pita, but they hadn't realized the importance of conservation of these species and also to think about the possibilities around ecotourism. So our first goal was to decrease the threats for the Galaria Castrani, especially with the use of ecotourism. So we started what we could with what we could feed the Galeria, Galeria's feeder. We don't have a fancy camera, so this is the images that we have. And Don Ariel every day was feeding Galeria individuals and Condinamarca and Pita 
with larvae that we can find and the forest stems. And we did everything possible to be able to catch pictures so people could get to know the species better. And we also started working on some trails around the reserve. So far, we have 2.5 kilometers of trails. We started with our own research and thanks to the conservation agreement, we have a better elaborated trails and we have some infrastructure in specific spots that are difficult to walk on and we're also promoting the observation of the other species that we can find there and something that has also been very important has been strengthen the house of Don Ariel and his family so these are the images of 2019 these were our first murals and now we have better murals and with the agreement we have been able to develop more elaborated things to promote ecotourism even better. So we also started working on the garden. So the birds arrive without artificial feed and we take lunch or dinner, we can observe what's around us. And also the restaurant, uh, toilets, services, everything that we need to provide quality ecotourism services. So right now we are still waiting for our official registry by the national government. And very interestingly, we are participating in, we are working on two activities. First, the research to get to know more about the species. What are the areas within the reserve with the highest population? So we can make decisions around that and decide where we need to establish different conservation strategies within the land for the conservation of the Cundinamarca Anpita and also the design and construction for of the first lodge. This is going to be part of the foundation and it's going to be eventually delivered to the Herrera family so they can increase their income and we want that with this income they can support conservation and promote it even more so this is this is what we're doing this is what we have been working on, we are taking care of the reserve. This is our proposal and we want to extend our invitation to everyone listening so you can get to know our project better. And that's all. Thank you. Quiero visitar. Gracias. <laughs> Muchas gracias. <laughs> uh, so I'll welcome everyone back to English speaking. Um, if you were on translation, you just need to switch it. Uh, we have one more special ABC guest uh, before we move into that, and that is Dan Levin. Welcome, Dan. Hi, Jordan. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dan Levin, Vice President of Threatened Species here at ABC. And I think we had one slide to show. There we go. Looks like it's coming. Right. So um, this slide is about the Bird Habitat Protection Fund. So we all know that birds need habitat and habitat loss is perhaps the most significant threat endangering bird species today. ABC has been addressing this issue by conserving bird habitat with our partners like Fundacion Kamana, including protecting more than 1.1 million acres in nature reserves across 14 countries. And these are strategically located like this reserve for the Kundinamarca Anpita to help the most threatened species. The Bird Habitat Protection Fund helps ABC develop and implement habitat protection projects with our partners, including land purchases and reserve designations. Supporting this fund helps us respond nimbly to opportunities and leverage further resources from other donors. So please support bird conservation through this fund at ABC, particularly if you like what you saw here in the webinar today. And I can also answer questions during our Q&A if uh, anyone has questions about uh, habitat protection projects and, and this fund. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. With that, I'm going to invite all of our presenters back onto camera and unmute. We are going to be mostly English for the Q&A. Um, so thank you everyone for bearing with us technology-wise. Um, first up, we're going to go back to Peter, because again, what an incredible experience. Um, 
And our first question is going to talk more about the technology and the tools that helped you uh, really understand and discover the secretive species. So Peter, do you want to share more about we're all birders? What did you have with you? <laughs> uh, well, back in the 1980s, uh, the technology was not nearly as, as developed as it is today. Uh, I was carrying a Sony TCM 5000 uh, cassette recorder and a uh, directional microphone made by, oh gosh, who was that? Uh, anyway, a directional shotgun microphone about this long. And um, I carried it everywhere. And, and there were very few recordings of, of known birds. But a lot of times what I would do is go out into the field, I'd hear something, make a recording of it, and then play it back immediately with a cassette tape. Um, there was no eBird. Um, the bird book that we had was a wonderful book by Steve Hilty, uh, The Birds of, of Columbia, which had wonderful uh, plates and whatever. But um, yeah, no, the, it, there was a, an awful lot of luck involved and serendipity, I guess. But I just happened to be at that right place and that right time when that bird started calling down in the, down in the valley below me. So yeah, uh, I guess you know part of it is uh, is is knowledge of knowing what birds are there, and, and I had spent at that point uh, almost a year and a half in Colombia, and and had a pretty good idea of, of most of the birds and and their songs. Um, but yeah, no, it was it was just serendipity. I happened to be at the right place at the right time, and and recognized it as something that uh, that was different. Amazing. And e, Natalia, Natalia, you had uh, information about drones and other technology for this species? Yes, from the reserve, in terms of the use of eBird to record uh, sightings, now we have a bird guide thanks to everything that we have been working on on bird watching but also being able to purchase drones so we can have a bigger coverage and a better analysis of the natural reserve for the galaria conservation and also the intention of the trap cameras so we are able to understand uh, the behavior of the galaria, for example, where it sleeps, what happens to it around the forest. So that is very important and also photography or bird watchers and the photos that we have. That's the best thing that we can get. Amazing. Um, back to you, Peter, uh, and, and anyone else on the panel, but could you tell us more about the other Ampitas in the region? Um, and again, just how did you know that this species was different and not say a subspecies or something more similar? Uh, well, the bird has a, a very distinctive call and it's actually the closest thing to it is a bird that is uh, restricted to the Santa Marta Mountains called the Santa Marta Antpita. And the Santa Marta Antpita is very similar to Little Paler and has some sort of orange or buffy on the throat. Um, and the Santa Marta Antpita has a, a two-noted call. It's sort of like a Bob White, a two Bob White, whereas this bird has a three-noted call. Feet, 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 feet. So yes, they, they, are, they are similar. Um, but they're they're distinct enough in the in the ant pitta world to uh, to know that they're they are quite different. If you go to the 16th of October 1989 eBird checklist that has the original uh, recording that I made the very first time I heard the bird, and also a description at the end of what I saw. If you go to that, the beginning of it, there are actually two ant pittas calling at the same time. A very common and widespread bird in Colombia that is called by Colombia's a comparapan or chestnut crowned ant pitta was calling at the same time. So that is a, a common bird that's also in that habitat. Another interesting bird there is the muisca ant pitta, which was recently split, I guess maybe three or four years ago, was split from the rufous ant pitta. 
and is a endemic bird that's just found in the eastern Andes of Colombia. And uh, that is also a fairly common bird there. Uh, we also had slate crowned ant pitta, which is in a different genus, Growler auricula, um, which is a little smaller ant pitta, is also found in that, that same area. I think that's all the ones that we had. So it would make uh, four ant pittas there. Well, we have a very engaged audience, uh, and I know at least I personally would love to visit the reserve and observe this bird as well. <laughs> Natalia, how can people visit the reserve, and when is the best time to come? Well, we are very close to Bogota, so it is an option for all bird watchers that are visiting Colombia. It's only two hours, one hour and a half from Bogota, and it is on the route toward Villavicencio. So it is very easy to find, and I must say that throughout the year it's possible. In the summer, it's a lot easier to get to because of the roads. However, Don Ariel goes to Guayabetal and can pick you up and they can bring you up to the reserve and other people of the municipality can give you a ride all the way to the reserve. So it's Sendero Lerreria who operates the tourism activities and you can find them in social networks and also we can get you in touch with them so you are able to visit. It is important to mention that Galeria is uh, very sensitive to extreme changes of weather. So if it rains a lot and then it's a lot of sun, it is a little bit harder to find. It, it takes longer to go to the feeder, but otherwise you can see them every day because yeah, yeah. Don Ariel feeds them every day. Feeder of the chart. I want to make sure, Eliana, that you get to share some and Peter and Natalia too, but um, given that this is so community driven, how do the local community members uh, feel about this bird and all of the attention with the reserve now, mostly from birders and ecotourism, but how has this bird brought people together um, more directly located in that area? Eliana, do you want to share about your experience traveling there? Well, yeah, I can share a little, but uh, I think Peter has visited Guayabetal more than me. I know he has like pictures in the in the little town of Guayabetal. Um, but no, I I had the opportunity to meet uh, like the Herrera family, and they are great. They are completely committed with this. Like they kind of started this like an alternative at some point in their life, and I think right now has become. Their, their whole life, the the um, younger no so sorry the older son, he is great. He was our um, like bird guy while we were there, and he knows super well the songs and the birds of the area. So yeah, I again I cannot speak for all the community itself. I was specifically in the reserve, but. Um, it, it is amazing. I feel they are really committed and this is something they want to on the long term. Peter, would you like to add anything? Yeah, no, I just wanted to, to add about the, uh, Natalia said that that you have to, to afford a, you stage in the town of Guayabatal, which is actually on the road to Via Vicencio. And then you go up a very, very steep road on by four by four to get up to the, to the Herrera's um, finca. And in the town of Guayabatal, there are photographs of the Cundinamarca ant pitta on the on sides of the thing. And even the um, the taxis are called trans toro torai. Toro torai is a, a word, local word for an ant pitta. So the ant pitta is actually on the taxis and on the side of the of the uh, uh, tourism office. So it is very clear that the the community of Guayabatal, which is the nearest town to the Herrera's Finca, has embraced the the ant pitta and is benefiting. You can see I, I bought a uh, an ice cream there from the 
from the ice cream shop, and I'm sure that I mean just a, a tiny, tiny bit of the of the commerce that's being brought to that uh, location by the uh, by the birding community that uh, it goes out to see the bird. Amazing. Um, another question that came in during the presentations is for Natalia asking about non-bird species and other wildlife in the reserve. Uh, do you want to share anything that you've noticed? Um, is the area healthy? Uh, they'd like to know just how is the habitat and ecosystem overall? Well, in this moment, we are in the research stage. We are doing scientific exploration because we also have amphibians in the area. We have a couple of species and that can give us an idea of the health of the ecosystem. So reptiles and orchids are also a very good indicator. And so those we would consider are key species that we are observing within the reserve and doing more yes. research on. Um, going back to Eliana, um, uh, folks would like to know about some of the challenges in this process, in this journey to creating the new reserve and having helping to protect this bird and its habitat. Do you have any, uh, any comments on the the area that you, know, you had to work in, being far away, um, trying to work on this specific habitat and ecosystem. Um, to be fair, I think this has been relatively easy. <laughs> uh, I mean, like Peter and Natalia have mentioned already, is like right in between Bogota and Villavicencio is like, a highway so it's really easy to to move to get there in like just in a I think you can get in a bus to Guayavital and then just uh like hire Don Ariel so he can take you up to the reserve but anyway it, in comparison with other reserves and other partners that we have in more remote areas <laughs> it has been easy but um of course I'm not the one in the field Natalia probably <laughs> <laughs> can say something different <laughs> um but another of the good like is i think it's good for this project is the herrera family is the last house in that road so you got the road and they are like literally like the road ends in their house so that has been um really convenient because we can be sure that at least that access to the reserve is protected by the Herrera family. And they are like the phase and the main point of contact if you want to access the area. So um, yeah, of course there are like, the other thing is like the area is very steep. So it's not that easy just to like arrive from other different places to the reserve. Um, so, I mean, Again, it is a difficult area, but in terms of the project and how easy it was, I think it, it was easy compared to other places. <laughs> yeah, Peter. Yeah, I must say, um, it, it, I, I, I don't know that much about the ABC's legal workings, but I would bet that we set some sort of a record. The fact that, that I brought the proposal to you guys, I think in February, and like 13 months later the whole the thing is done i mean it was it was an amazingly quick uh process and i think you know part of it is that it is a, a place that's accessible but as i mentioned before i think a lot of it is with the fundacion kamana because you had a a a willing and very competent local partner that that knew what they were doing and had already done all the groundwork to make sure that 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 the community was on board, that the family was on board, and I think ABC just sort of came in and said, "Wow, this is this is going to be easy," and just poop uh, wrote got the money. Which I mean, I, I not to de-emphasize the the donors and the people that that uh, that donated money, but 
in terms of the actual sort of the the bureaucracy of creating a reserve, I think an awful lot of it is credit to Fundacion Camana, who did so much of the groundwork. And uh, it's it. I, I was amazed just how quickly this whole thing has come come together. And, and I assume that the bureaucrats and ABC were were impressed also. Would anyone like to add to that? <laughs> well, given that, um, we've gotten quite a few questions regarding the future, uh, specifically the outlook for the species. How is it doing? Are we preventing extinction? Um, one question came in specifically after uh, Eliana showed a map about the gap analysis part. So maybe Dan, I'd love to, I'd love for you to participate in the conversation, and maybe you can share a little bit more um, about how things are looking and what that gap analysis is telling us for the future of this species. Sure. Well, I think Eliana did a really good job presenting that information. the The essence of this is that we've wanted to map, have the best maps possible of these birds and their ranges so that we could overlay those with the current existing network of protected areas like national parks and municipal reserves and all of those kind of things. And we wanted to do that so that we could tell which birds are really underprotected by this existing network of reserves. And so uh, we've done that, we're working on publishing those results. The Kundinamarca amphita was one of many birds that showed up in our analysis of being underprotected. It's not quite as bad as some. Some have zero habitat protected, but um, we thought it needed more. And what, we, what we're trying to do is make sure that these species have uh, sufficient habitat to protect at least 500 individuals um, as like a viable population. And if the whole global population is less than 500, then as many, if not all of them as possible. And so um, this was a great place to start with the conservation work for the Kundin and Marca Anpita. Um, what I've been answering in the, in the Q&A is that the reserve that Fundacion Kamana now owns actually connects and overlaps slightly with a municipal protected area that's further upslope on the same ridge. Um, but that municipal protected area, I don't think had a lot of management. It also doesn't have a lot of good access. And by protecting the land that's at the end of the highway, we can now have a lot more control over the access to this. And so this smaller reserve that Kamana owns now actually helps conserve this much larger area that is protected by the municipality further upslope that's also habitat for the bird. So that's really good, but we would like to see uh, more habitat protected in the future. This is just where we've gotten to to date, and um, we hope that there'll be more opportunities to protect other parts of this bird's range that you could see on the map. And then it's not just this bird, of course. There are a lot of other species where we're doing the same thing. Where we're saying, okay, for example, in Peru, the Marino and and the Marignon Valley of Peru and Ecuador, the Marignon Spinetail is not really protected much. It's almost completely outside protected areas. We'd like to develop new projects for that species and other similar birds in the region. And, you know, just start picking off all the birds that, that haven't gotten this level of protection and starting to develop projects and implement them. And that's really what we've been doing um, for many years. And uh, we're just trying to figure out what is it gonna take to finish that job and present that and communicate it in a way that is attractive to donors to say, yeah, we want to join on for this and then make it happen. Incredible. It's such an important start and there's so much more to do, but there is hope, which is really what I hope the audience can take away from all of this work. Um, in conjunction with all of that, especially Dan, since you're still unmuted, but Eliana too, um, folks would like to know, does this include more bird surveys and what other information about the birds is going into all of this work to um, increase conservation efforts? Basically, are there ant pittas other places and we just don't know? Um, well, actually I had a, a short discussion with Natalia this morning. We were talking about like the next steps uh, of this project. And one of the things that um, we think is important to do is just evaluate areas in all the Guayavital air, um, municipality to see where the Anpira is more abundant. Like we know it's very abundant right now within the reserve, but I don't know if there are other areas outside from the reserve where the species is, is um, 
common. So um, that's part of the things we are going to like evaluate and see if we can fundraise for. <laughs> um, and who knows, potentially, if we find new places where the species is more abundant, more common, we can like start thinking maybe in a second reserve for the amphitheater. I don't know. It depends what we can, what they can find on the field. Yeah, the, with the data we have, we projected what we think the range could be within the right altitudes and where forest cover remains. So we have some idea where we think the bird should be. And then within the reserve, um, so the, the Herrera family is running this ecotourism uh, enterprise just like on the border of the reserve right there. And they're helping come and manage the reserve. And the son, who I think was like early 20s, a young guy, he's working as a, he's leading birding tours, he's guiding, he knows the birds really well, he knows all the songs by ear, and he's doing transects within the reserves and counting the birds and doing some kind of monitoring of the amphitheater within that reserve. So that's really useful too. A new question just came in. Oh, you go, Peter. Oh, just one of the things is that this area of Columbia has very few roads in it. So a lot of the potential habitat at that altitude range in the Eastern Andes um, is going to be basically inaccessible unless you, you have some sort of an expedition. And going through that kind of forest, if there isn't already a trail or road, is, is very, very difficult. Um, one of the recent questions that came in that relates to this is it seems as though the success of this entire story is because of the people, <laughs> especially the involvement of the local community and um, all of the bureaucratic work going so well. So how do we find more wonderful people to work with and replicate <laughs> this <laughs> in other areas? <laughs> I think that really is just a big shout out to Natalia and all of the other family members that we've worked with, the local community and partners, and, and truly, again, bringing us all together. Um, I have to ask one more question before we wrap up with time quickly running out, and that is for Peter. What number was the amp pitta in your 10,000 bird? Oh, my list? goodness gracious. Oh, oh my goodness gracious. I have, wow. I had to, oh gosh. Uh, let me, let me think about it. We're going to another question. Let me see if I can figure it out. <laughs> oh gosh. That was so long ago. Woo. To 98. That would have been somewhere around 4,500. I think it was under 5,000. Which is still incredible. About halfway. I was about halfway. Amazing. Um, I'm I'm sure all of us would love to hear all of your stories about your 10,000 birds and more, um, but we'll have to save that for another webinar. So before we uh, wrap up this webinar, I want to ask all of our presenters, we'll go in order of um, of the presentations, one last question. And that is, what is one thing that you hope folks take away from this webinar and share with a friend? So Peter, if you wanna go first. Already, you already said it. Uh, it's the word hope. It, it, it's, this whole thing has been so serendipitous that I, I bumped into the bird, that we have such a capable and, and remarkable group in the Fundacion Camana, that we have the Herrera family, just they're, all these wonderful things coming together gives us great hope for the species. And just thank you for all the people donating and let's keep it, keep it coming. Thank you, Peter. And Eliana? Um, I would like to say that conservation is in possible with our local communities. I mean, this is definitely an example that like, no matter how many do you have, if you don't have a good partner on the field, it's really difficult to do conservation, like effective conservation. So I do want to give another shout out to Fundacion Camana and the Herrera family, because they have been great. And of course, um, Peter has been helping us a lot and all the donors and supporters that like gave money for this project like all the stakeholders involved in these have been great. Uh, thanks to that, we have 
this reserve right now. Wonderful. In Natalia? Yo, me. me I, I'm taking with me, or and I want to give a shout out to all the family members that are behind this project. Without all of you, without the stakeholders, without Eliana, without Peter, without the donors, this wouldn't be possible. So getting to know you and seeing the logo of ABC is something that fills our heart and it gives us strength because we don't feel alone. We know that there is a family that is supporting us from afar to continue with the conservation of the land and the territory. And I just want to invite everyone to come visit us. And that's basically it. Muchas gracias. And Dan. Yeah, everyone said it well. So I'll just recap. Um, the enabling conditions exist in this situation to have success. We had the partners, we had the supporters, we had the project. Everything came together well. And, and part of that was supporters like all of you that help ABC make these things happen. So please continue to support this project, support ABC, go visit the Herrera family, go see the ant pitta at the worm feeding station right there after a nice breakfast and uh, you'll enjoy it and um, help us make the next reserves, the next species so that we can keep doing webinars and sharing success stories like this for many other species. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. With that, we'll now end the webinar. Thank you to our audience for joining us. Again, all of this information will be posted online and is available in the future. Uh, I really hope all of you get to observe this bird and so many more in the future. Thank you again and good birding. Muchas gracias. Thank you.